Hi, Bill Fender here. Since March 10th of 2023, there has been a bank run. 71 banks have collapsed in the U.S. and 1,400 banks have collapsed worldwide. In this episode of How We Got Here, let's continue the discussion of money and banking. Money, again, was originally precious metals which were weighed on a scale. Then King Croesus minted the first coins in the 6th century B.C., and then Romans began to devalue those coins by mixing in less valuable metals. And then it was their version of inflation. By the 13th century, China's Kublai Khan issued the first paper currency. And in the 15th century, Islamic Turks invaded Greece, causing Greeks to flee and with their money, their art, their architecture, their language, and their holy scriptures from Greece into Florence. This is called the Renaissance. With the Muslim Ottoman Empire cutting off the land routes to India and China, this is when Columbus set sail on behalf of Spain to look for a sea route to China. Ran into the Latin America, right? Central America and found gold. Well, the Spanish took the gold from Central and South America and used it to fight the Muslim Turks from keeping them from taking over Europe. Well, Spain spent the money as fast as it got the money, leading to Spain's eventual financial collapse. <laughs> ben Franklin described in The Way to Wealth, 1758, if you would be wealthy, think of saving as well as getting. The Indies have not made Spain rich because her outgoes are greater than her incomes. Well, Renaissance wealth from Greece fled into these Italian banks <clears throat> like the 15th century Medici family. Their banking houses were huge. I had the chance to go to school in Europe in college, and we went to Florence and saw these enormous banking houses that took up an entire block, and they're all very ornate castle-like structures, and that's where people would keep their gold to keep it safe. Now, banking houses realized that people didn't like to take their gold out every day and walk around with it. It was dangerous. It was cumbersome. So they would keep their gold in the banking house. And the banking house realized that it only needed to keep a portion of the gold actually in the house, and it could lend out the rest at interest. This is called fractional reserve banking. And this money lent out at interest would then be paid back to the depositors, making them, ha them happy, and also to the bankers themselves, making them very, very wealthy. And so they also realized that if you wanted to, to do a transaction, instead of you running down to the banking house, taking out some gold, giving it to the person you're buying something from, and then they would run down to the banking house and deposit the gold, all you'd have to do is just write a note to the banking house and sign it saying, take some gold out of my drawer and put it in my neighbor's drawer. And so these turned into bank notes and eventually bank currency. And the bank banks would issue these paper currencies that you could interact with each other. And then governments would have banks. Now, the American colonies printed their own money until the King of England stopped them. This was the Currency Acts of, of 1764. Ben Franklin wrote, the colonies would have gladly borne a little tax on tea and other matters had it not been that England took away from the colonies their money, which created unemployment and dissatisfaction. The inability of colonists to get power to issue their own money permanently out of the hands of King George III and the international bankers was the prime reason for the Revolutionary War. Imagine that. Ben Franklin said money. The ability for us to have our own money without the king was the prime reason for the Revolutionary War. Well, since governments had few regulations regarding banks printing currency, unscrupulous banks would overprint their currency and do extreme fractional reserve and would have almost no money, no gold actually in their bank. And then when there was a panic, they would sweep the country. Everyone would run down to the bank to get their money out, and there wasn't enough. And banks would fail. Now, the issuing of currency without any backing of gold is called fiat. And it's an Italian word, which means let it be done. Or in other words, let it just simply be used as money, even though there's no backing for it. 
and during the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress issued fiat money. It had no gold backing, just a promise that if we won the revolution, then the paper currency would be paid back in gold or silver, uh, hopefully with interest. And uh, they printed too much of it. Nobody wanted it. It wasn't sure if we were going to win. And so this paper currency issued by the Continental Congress uh, became more or less worthless. And so there was a phrase that said, not worth a continental. And um, uh, Jefferson uh, wrote to Colonel Edward Carrington, May 27th of 1788, paper is poverty. It is only the ghost of money and not money itself. In other words, there's no actual gold value to this piece of paper. James Madison wrote, paper money is unjust. It is unconstitutional for it affects the rights of property as much as taking away equal value in land. George Washington wrote to Thomas Jefferson, August 1st of 1786, paper money has had the effect in your state to ruin commerce, oppress the honest, and open the door to every species of fraud and injustice. Well, the lessons learned from this not worth a continental paper currency, not backed by gold, uh, was put into practice with our U.S. Constitution. And so the U.S. Constitution gave the federal government only the authority to mint coins, not print paper currency. And these coins had a value that was fixed to the stable Spanish silver dollar. And this is Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Congress shall have power to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and a foreign coin and fix the standard weights and measures. It was Roger Sherman that signed the Constitution authorizing Article 1, Section 10. No state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, not paper currency. Uh, Roger Sherman wrote in caveat against injustice or an inquiry into evils of fluctuating medium of exchange. This was written in 1752. Paper currency bills of credit are of no intrinsic value, and their value is fluctuating and very uncertain. And therefore, it would be unjust that any person should be obliged to receive them in payment as money. Money ought to be something of certain value, it being that whereby other things are to be valued. Like a ruler, it doesn't shrink and expand. It, it's a standard. In 1817, Jefferson predicted of paper money, Abuses are inevitable, and by breaking up the measure of value, make a lottery of all private property. Jefferson wrote to John Wales Epps in 1813, bank paper must be suppressed and the circulating medium of gold and silver coin must be restored to the nation to whom it belongs. Jefferson wrote to John Taylor, May 26, 1816, the system of banking is a blot, which, if not covered, will end in their destruction, which is already hit by the gamblers in corruption, and is sweeping away in its progress the fortunes and morals of our citizens. I sincerely believe that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies, and that the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity under the name of funding is but swindling future the future on a larger scale of uh, futurity is the word they used. Robert Morris was the U.S. superintendent of finance. He raised money during the Revolutionary War for the Continental Army. After the revolution, Robert Morris and Alexander Hamilton, with the support of Ben Franklin, founded the Bank of North America in 1781. It was the nation's first de facto central bank with the goal of providing a stable currency necessary for international trade. In 1791, Alexander Hamilton arranged for the Bank of North America to be replaced with the Bank of the United States. Jefferson, Madison, and the Attorney General Edmund Randolph were critical of this first centralized bank as it concentrated too much money and too much power in the hands of too few people. So now we're talking about the dangers of concentrated financial power. The Bank of the United States was a private institution 
whose stockholders were lord, largely foreign investors, though they were not allowed to vote. And so you had British, even this is after the revolution, British were investing in this bank and this bank was influencing the finances of America. William Pitt, the prime minister of Great Britain, saw his country's debt double to 243 million pounds during the American Revolutionary War. So the British not just lost the war, they got in very much debt. Uh, and so William Pitt said, let the American people go into their debt funding schemes and banking systems. And from that hour, their boasted independence will be a mere phantom. So you'll think you'll be independent, but if you're having somebody else control your currency, Jefferson accused the Bank of the United States of, be of becoming a machine for the corruption of the legislature. And so now you have a bank with fractional reserve banking, keeping some lending out the rest and having this fl extra flow of money um, and buying politicians. In 1811, Madison refused to recharter the Bank of the United States. And British financiers reportedly owned two thirds of the stock in this bank that was uh, influencing America's interest rates and uh, financial economy. And so when Madison refused to recharter the Bank of the United States with British investors, the War of 1812 started. And some think that that could have been one of the reasons that the war started, that the British wanted their money back. Hamilton founded the Bank of New York in 1784. This later merged with Mellon Bank. And this bank of Alexander Hamilton loaned the money to pay the salaries of the congressmen. The country was just getting started and there wasn't a lot of money. In 1789, Hamilton became the first U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. And in 1799, Aaron Burr founded the Manhattan Water Company under the auspices of bringing fresh water into New York City. But in a sly way, he switched and turned this water company into the Manhattan Bank, which later merged with Chase Bank. And so now you have the two people that started these banks, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr. And uh, in 1800, Aaron Burr used his bank's resources to influence elections in New York and defeated Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law, who was the senator in New York. The two got at odds and had a duel, and Aaron Burr shot and killed Alexander Hamilton. Well, France. France helped America during the Revolutionary War. It won. We won. But, in, but France did not get anything in return for winning, just debt. So the British came out of the Revolutionary War in debt, and France came out of helping us in the Revolutionary War in debt. And their debt got so bad that King Louis XVI was forced from his throne and beheaded, January 21st, 1793. A French Republic was formed, but in 1799, it was bankrupt, setting the stage for Napoleon to seize power. The author, Wilson McNair, wrote in Monarchy or Money Power, in 1933. When a government, Napoleon declared, is dependent for money upon bankers, they, not the leaders of the government, control the situation since the hand that gives is above the hand that takes. Money, Napoleon declared, has no motherland. The financiers are without patriotism and without decency. Their sole object is gain. And now we're seeing that on a global level. Well, an important banking family in Europe was the Rothschilds. And they uh, had the father, Meyer Amschel Rothschild, who lived 1743 to 1812. He had five sons and he set them up in banking houses across Europe. And so Amschel Mayer Rothschild had controlled the banking house in Frankfurt. Salomon Rothschild con controlled the banking house in Vienna. Karl Rothschild, uh, controlled a banking house in Naples, James Rothschild in Paris, and Nathan Meyer Rothschild in London. And wars would be fought or not fought, depending on whether the Rothschild family thought it was financially worthwhile. 
And because the kings would have to go to these bankers and say, hey, can you lend us money to fight this war against this other country? And the other country's king would go to the other Rothschild family members bank and say, hey, can you lend me money to fight this other king? And so the two brothers would talk and a maxim was attributed to the house of Rothschild. Let us control the money of a nation and we care not who makes its laws. Well, Nathan Rothschild helped finance the Duke of Wellington's battle against Napoleon. And this was one of the biggest battles in Europe, 100,000 soldiers, enormous battle. And so you have the Duke of Wellington financed by Nathan Rothschild uh, and fighting Napoleon uh, in the Battle of Waterloo. The legend persists that Nathan Rothschild obtained early information that the British defeated and won the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, June 18th of 1815. But before the news of the victory reached London, Nathan Rothschild began to sell all his shares on the London Stock Exchange. And the word quickly spread and the other investors thought, well, Rothschild must have some inside information that we lost and the French are gonna take over Britain. And so they start dumping everything and selling it dirt cheap. Meanwhile, uh, as this panic selling, this bank run was going on, uh, the Rothschild representatives bought up all the other shares that were being sold at dirt cheap prices. When the news arrived the next day that the British won the Battle of Waterloo, the London Stock Exchange went through the roof. The month, everything went up in value. And the saying is that the Rothschilds made a million pounds sterling in one day. Well, uh, there's more to the story of banking, but I'm going to uh, save that for another episode. So I hope you enjoyed this look into the history of money and banking, and it affects us every single day. So thank you for watching and look forward to the next time. God bless.